Uh, Father in heaven, what we know to be true as your children is that we um, are not in want. We are not um, neglected children. We are not hungry. We have not asked you for bread and you have not given us a stone. But we are rich and we are full to overflowing with your very presence in our life. Father, this is not a meager life that we live, but this is a, a life of strength that you have given us to live. Even though these bodies are failing us, even though trials and tragedies still strike us, this is not a, a weak life that we live in you and in your name. It is a life of strength because the strength comes from you. What a life of stability and strength and protection and refuge we live. We are thriving in you, in your son. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Please be seated. (coughs) Excuse me. Let's take our Bibles this morning and let's open them back up to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we're going to cover verses 5 to 7 this morning. Believer, I want to ask you as we start this morning a question, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. When you think about your sanctification process, you know, when, when you think about becoming more and more holy, when you think about learning to observe all that Jesus commanded you, when you think about living a life that's pleasing to the Lord, When you think about your life of resisting temptation and sin, would you describe yourself as confident in that? Not arrogant, but confident. Would you describe yourself in your sanctification process as proactive? Proactive. Would you describe yourself as hopeful? hopeful in your sanctification process, would you describe yourself as eager, eager for it, eager for the fight? Or would you describe yourself in your sanctification process more as as doubtful than confident, reactive rather than proactive, fearful? rather than hopeful, dreading your fight, rather than eager to fight. I think the determining factor in this is how accurately you understand what the grace of God has achieved for you or not. How accurately you understand it or not. It depends on how accurately you understand what grace has done to you upon saving you. If you are unaware of what grace has done for you, to you, you'll start to feel more like the prey in your sanctification process. And sin will feel like the hunter tracking you down. You see, in the chase and in the hunt, the prey is fearful. The prey is reactive. The prey is not very confident, and the prey dreads the hunter. But the more aware you are of what grace has done for you and to you, the more you can have confidence in your fight against sin. You will be more like... um, a confident, proactive, hopeful, eager hunter who's tracking down your doubts, tracking down your fears, your dreads, your temptations, and eliminating them through grace. And our section in Romans chapter 6 this morning seeks to make us, as believers in Jesus Christ, more assured more assured about what grace has achieved for us in our fight for holiness of life. I'm going to read verses 1 through 14 because we're in this first section. But I want you to see the whole thing, and I I want you to listen carefully. Verse 1, 
Paul says, what shall we say then? Are, are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And these are our verses today. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly... Certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe. We believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ Having been raised from the dead is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now listen to verses 12 to 14. And ask yourself, does that sound like someone who feels like they're the prey in their sanctification or if they're on the hunt in their sanctification? Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you because you are not under law, but you are under grace. Do you feel fearful like the prey feels fearful in your sanctification, or do you feel confident? Not confident in you, not arrogant, confident in what the grace of God has achieved. Paul writes this like there's every reason to be assured. R remember, Romans 6 is... The gospel's defense of grace. Two false charges commonly came to Paul against grace as he preached the gospel. Complaints about the way that grace saves through justification through faith alone. You remember, because grace justifies the ungodly. Grace doesn't justify uh, the reforming, the ones who are trying to uh, clean themselves up and Grace doesn't justify those. No, grace justifies the ungodly. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Justifies the ungodly through faith alone and not by any works. And the wrong impression that some conclude about grace from that is that, well, then grace doesn't concern itself with sin. Even worse, maybe grace benefits from sin's increase. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, Paul says, Romans 5, verse 21. And what Romans chapter 6 is, is the gospel's defense of grace against such slanderous thinking. And there are two gospel defenses given. We're just right in the middle of gospel defense number one, and so here it is. Let's put it back up and review a little bit. Gospel defense number one is in the first 14 verses, and we could summarize the gospel's first defense from verses one and two this way. Grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. Verse one, what shall we say? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? If sin continues and grace increases, that's kind of a mutually benefiting relationship, is it not? The answer, in no way. May it never be. There is no partnership. Therefore, grace, if it isn't in partnership with your sin in any way possible, it is only against your sin, believer, and everything it does in your life is to help you fight against your indwelling sin that remains. So because grace in no way is in partnership with sin in your life, therefore grace's fight against sin in the believer, number one, and this is all review, is a matter of death and life for me. According to grace, believer, verse two, you died to sin, and that death radically impacts the way that you live. You died 
and now you live a new life. It's a matter of death and life for you. You experienced, by grace's doing, a death that has made you, believer, a different person. A different person in the presence of the same indwelling sin. You are not the same person in the presence of the same sin, and therefore you live differently than you did prior to being saved by grace. Grace's fight begins here. This is the point. You died to sin, and now you live a new life. You died to sin in this way that you can't any longer live in it. Grace's fight against sin in the believer, number two, requires me to investigate and know grace's achievements. All throughout this, in verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 16, and even in verse 19 where Paul is putting on the bottom shelf grace's achievements because we're weak in our flesh to understand this, the, the emphasis throughout this chapter is that you need to know these things. You cannot be unaware. Do you not know? He says twice. You can't be in a position in which you do not know these things, and if you do not know these things, you will feel doubtful about what's going on in your sanctification process, fearful. You'll even dread it. And as you'll see today, God has in mind for you a very experientially based knowledge of grace's achievements down in verse six in a little bit here. Grace's fight against sin in the believer, number three, still reviewing, is rooted in my union with Christ. Grace's fight against your sin in your life, it, it doesn't happen apart from Jesus Christ. He is not a spectator over in the stands watching you down on the field fight against your sin. You are united with him in some very profound ways. We're going to see this in verse 5 today. If we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Grace's fight against sin and the believer, fourthly, broadcasts my changed relationship to sin through my baptism, which would have been one of the very first things a believer in Jesus Christ did in the New Testament, was go into the water in a very public setting and broadcast my changed relationship to Jesus Christ. Paul's answer for the reason why the one who died still can't live, continue to live in sin centers on what the believer publicly broadcast through his water baptism. That's verses two and three. The proof offered for how one died to sin and therefore still cannot live in it is, don't you know what you broadcasted to your community through your baptism? The way grace makes you ready, the, the way that grace makes you equipped to fight against remaining corruption inside you was to unite you with Christ crucified, Christ buried, and Christ raised from the dead. Going under the water, coming up out of the water, does not cause that union with Christ. It just simply broadcasts that reality for the believer. It broadcasts that union publicly to your community. What you were under sin, what you were towards sin without Christ, it had to change. Nothing of the way that you related to your sin and nothing of the way you related with all of your former comrades in sin in the community, the lost community you lived in, all of that had to change. A new you had to come forth so that you could fight against your sin with the grace of God. And God's means for grace to achieve that was to unite you with Christ crucified, Christ buried, Christ raised from the dead. And that not only radically changed the way that you relate to your sin, but it also stepped you out to walk in a newness of life that you never before imagined before grace saved you. And the point in verses three and four with the emphasis on baptism that grace is making regarding its fight against sin is your baptism broadcasts all of that doesn't achieve it for you. It broadcasts that it has happened. So how then could anyone come to, to the conclusion that grace is content with sin in your life to continue, even increase, so that grace can also increase? If grace was truly in partnership with sin somehow, 
But then had you very early on in your Christian life broadcast that kind of a relationship change to sin, that makes no sense. That would be a contradiction of the most wicked kind. Well, today, let's just add one more point, number five. Grace's fight against sin in the believer, number five, assures me, assures me that union with Christ is complete, not partial, and freed me from slavery to sin, verses five to seven. Grace's fight against sin in the believer assures me that union with Christ is complete and it freed me from slavery to sin. It's verses 5 to 7. Verse 5, you see it there? The word for, meaning that further explanation is provided that confirms with certainty what Paul just said in verse 4. We have been buried with him through baptism in the death so that as Christ was, all, was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 4 is so important that Paul wants to make sure that it is confirmed. He wants to make it more certain in our minds, so he looks to explain its truth another way to us. So really from verse 5 through 11, Paul will actually work back through the whole union with Christ crucified and Christ raised reality for us. This explanation to come, it actually strengthens what he just said about what it means to have died with Christ, been buried with him, and raised from the dead with him. And specifically, the point of this section, verses 5 to 7, is to hunt down some prey, to track the prey, to corner it, and kill it. And the prey is doubt in your mind. The prey is doubt in your mind, believer, about what grace has said it achieved for you in your union with Christ in verse 4. Grace is telling you so far in this chapter what it has done with you to set you against your indwelling sin inside. Now, now, now grace anticipates that there, there actually may be some doubts about um, what grace has done through your union with Christ that sets you against your sin. And your doubts must be diligently tracked, ruthlessly hunted, and mercilessly killed. Verse 5, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And there's a little hint here. If, if grace is trying to eliminate doubts in you, or to bring greater assurance and certainty about your union with Christ, believer, then, then do the same thing. Do what grace is doing in your life. Look for where you are doubting grace's achievements. Because those doubts are deadly regarding your progress in holy living. It'll make the difference between um, acting like the prey in your sanctification or acting like the hunter in your sanctification. Don't listen to your doubts. Look for your doubts. Don't collapse under your doubts because you listen to them. Kill your doubts because you looked for them and you eliminated them with these assurances from grace. The further explanation here that pushes for greater assurance uh, about your union with Christ, it also becomes more descriptive in verse five. Look at verse five. It says, we have become united with him. That literally means to be grafted into a tree, like a branch is grafted into a tree. We have been grafted into Christ like a branch is grafted into a tree. We have that kind of union with him. The branch that gets grafted into a tree, it begins to partake of and share in the life-giving benefits of the tree, doesn't it? The branch draws from the life of the tree. The source of life for the branch was outside the branch in the tree, but once it's grafted in, it shares in the life of that tree. And our union with Christ means that we are not the source of spiritual vigor 
in the fight against our sin. If your fuel, believer, for your fight against sin is your own strength in life, you have every reason to be doubtful. Every reason to be doubtful in your sanctification. You have every reason to dread another day of that fight. You have every reason to be fearful. You have every reason to be reactive and just put your arms up because you are just getting pummeled and you've, you can't even think of a strategy to go after because you're just in your own weakness um, blocking what's coming your way, trying to block what's coming your way. The source of your spiritual benefit is in Christ, not in you. Because you've been grafted into him. You are united with him. Also, our union with Christ is not achieved by us any more than a branch grafts itself into a tree. God in his grace did it. And our union with Christ therefore means that we have an uncommon unity and intimacy with him. Notice in verse 5, by grace's achievement, that we are grafted into him, it says, in the likeness, in the likeness of his death. And the same thought is carried over to the resurrection. We are grafted into Christ in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, why does he say likeness? Because our death to sin was, was indeed his death at the cross. That's where my death is located. That's where yours is located, believer. But that doesn't mean my death is equal in every way to his death. And the same could be said about our union with Christ in his resurrection. My resurrection is located in his resurrection. But that doesn't mean my resurrection is equal to his in every way possible. There are ways, obviously, in which his death and resurrection go eternally and significantly beyond ours. Ours is located in his death and resurrection, and therefore it is like his, but it is not equal to his. And the point here in verse 5 is if, verse 5, for if we have become united with him, then certainly, indeed, undoubtedly, the other will happen. Jesus' death was not the period on his work, it was the comma. The resurrection had to follow. The religious leadership of the temple who condemned him Pilate, who sentenced him, his disciples who followed him, and the women who went with spices to the tomb, all believed the only reality possible for Jesus was death and burial. It was a period for them. It was over. Not one of those was remotely thinking, he's going to rise from the dead. Not one had certainty concerning his re resurrection prior to it. But obviously, Jesus only ever said that he would rise from the dead. The Father's plan was to indeed, certainly, undoubtedly show up in all of his glory at the tomb and raise him from the dead. Verse 4, as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. And from the inseparableness of his death and resurrection comes our assurance Jesus' resurrection could not be postponed a second longer than God planned, and it certainly could not be prevented altogether. As assured, as certain, as confident you can be that Jesus had to be and indeed was raised from the dead, so you can be assured that if you have become united with Christ in the likeness of his death, certainly, indeed, undoubtedly, you also will be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. You see, Part of grace's fight against sin in your life is to assure you that the union with Christ that grace has achieved for you was complete, not half done. Like it was impossible for Jesus just to die and not be raised. So it is impossible for you to only be united or grafted into him in the likeness of his death without also being grafted into him in the likeness of his resurrection. Listen, if he was not also raised, nothing he accomplished in his death matters. And if you are not also raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection, nothing in your union with him in his death counts. Counts. 
It is an all or nothing union with Christ. And because you have all of the union with Christ, you have certainty, believer, that the life you share in that is his is sufficient for your fight in your sanctification. Today, little branch, you have all, not half of the life-giving spiritual benefits from the tree who is Christ. And when Paul here in verse 5 uses the future tense, we shall also be, that's simply the use of the future tense to express certainty experienced now. It's a way of saying something will always happen if we are united with Christ in the likeness of his death. If that happens, we will indeed be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, it's also theologically true that we will also one day in the future experience a bodily resurrection that's in the likeness of his. But that's not what this context is even focusing on. It's all about now, how we live now. Present day living is in view. Well, what flows from this absolute certainty concerning our union, our complete union with Christ crucified and Christ raised? It's this, look at verse six. Knowing this. Knowing this. The, the kind of knowing that's mentioned here is not the mere factual apprehension of facts. It includes that for sure, but this knowing goes well beyond that into personal knowing, intimate knowing, actual experiential knowing. This isn't knowing merely about something, but it's actually experientially, personally knowing something. So we are, we are knowing something experientially which flows from this absolute and complete and certain union with Christ. And it, it's a present tense knowing in verse 6. We are continually knowing by our actual personal experience this. This continual personal experiential knowing flows from your certainty about the completeness of your union with Christ. That's the emphasis. And we haven't even looked at what the knowing is that you know. But this knowing, this kind of knowing, turns you from being the one who feels like you're being hunted down and tracked to, oh, I know what's going on. I experience it. The tables have been turned. I get it. And that knowing gets unfolded in three amazing statements. Look at verse 6. Statement number one. Our old self was crucified with him. In order that second amazing statement, our body of sin might be done away with. So that third amazing statement, we would no longer be slaves to sin. This is the experience you are personally, actually knowing from the outflow of your certain and complete union with Christ. Your old self was crucified with Christ so that your sinful body would undergo a very purposeful demise, which reveals the goal has been achieved, that you would no longer be a slave to sin. Believer, you are experientially, actually knowing this from the outflow of your union with Christ crucified and raised. That your old self was crucified with Christ for this purposeful, progressive demise of your sinful body, which proves the point that you are no longer slaves to sin. Now, let's take each one of those statements one at a time with all their pieces. And as I usually say, this will be the next best four hours of your life. It is amazing. <laughs> your old self, your old self, literally old man, 
And, and that word man is important because it clearly presents that a whole person is in view. A man is in view. A self is in view. A woman is in view. The contrast would be your old leg, your old torso, your old arm. It's nothing like that. The old man. You see, pieces and portions of you were not selected out from the whole to be crucified with Christ while the rest of the pieces of you were spared. The entire you is in view. Whatever the complete union with Christ was that was accomplished in you, it had to include all of you, all of you, the man, the woman, the entire self. No part of you was spared from or survived your crucifixion with Christ, believer. But, but which self, which self, which man, which woman? It says in verse 5, the old man, your old man. We're not talking about your dad. He's the other old man, right? Old means here in the sense this. It means completely worn out and useless, fit only for the scrap heap. You know, there are some old things like that um, that we still have affections for, right? And there is no affection built into this word old like the affections you have for that ratty, old, worn-out sweatshirt from college that your wife wished you would have thrown away 20 years ago, but haven't yet. Maybe this is another illustration to help you look in the direction of what this word old means. The other day, I was dropping stuff off at Goodwill, um, and I happened to notice their trash in the back. Have you ever seen the trash behind Goodwill? That's the old stuff. That's the old stuff that Goodwill won't even take, right? One man's trash is another man's treasure. I mean, you've got, you've got stuff that you'll throw away that Goodwill might take, and I have some treasure from Goodwill. But what Goodwill throws away is so worn out, it is so useless, it is so fit for the scrap heap that you don't even want to touch it. And, and nobody is looking through their trash. It's that you that was crucified with Christ in your union with Christ. Where has Romans described a version like that of you? Chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, especially 5. That man, that self, was so old, it was so useless to God and worthy only of his wrath heap. The you that was embedded in the slab of sinful solidarity with the rest who also were worthy of his wrath heap, all there are useless to him except as an object of his wrath in his wrath heap. Notice that self, that man, that woman is not described as your weakened self, your underperforming self was crucified, your inconsistent self, your untapped potential self, your out of shape self. None of that. It was the you that was old in the worst way possibly spiritually. It was the old you that is actually the opposite of the newness of life that you are now living as a believer in verse 4. It was that old entire you that was crucified with Christ in your union with him. And notice what happened to that old self. It, it doesn't say, uh, obviously, that that old self was remodeled, refurbished, renovated, rather what? Crucified. Crucified. And, and that old you was not crucified alone. 
but somehow your entire old man was crucified with Christ. Now, let me ask you this. How many times was Jesus crucified? Obvious question, right? Once. What does that say about how effective crucifixion was for execution? Look down in verse 10. For the death that he died, Jesus, he died to sin, what? Once for all. Crucifixion was not something that any man under the Romans did more than once. Jesus didn't suffer crucifixion more than once, and your old self was crucified one time in your union with him in his one crucifixion, his one death. It's an unrepeatable event for each individual, this crucifixion of the old man with Christ. This unrepeatable crucifixion, it was a violent death. It was an unnatural death. This was not the natural way to die. It was a cursed death. It was a shocking and shameful death because you hung naked in public. It was not a noble way to die. The old man, fit for the wrath heap of God, the old man that lived out the opposite life of the newness of life that you now have in Christ, that old man was worthy of a violent death, was worthy of an unnatural death, was wor worthy of a cursed death and a shocking and shameful death, a death so effective it was unrepeatable. There is no affection upon this old self that was crucified. It's not an old sweatshirt that you still just can't let go of. There's no chance of that old man surviving the execution grace achieved. It was that kind of death that the old you went through once, believer. Not over and over and over again on a daily basis. The old man doesn't experience crucifixion over and over and over on a daily basis. He died. He's gone, believer. Crucifixion doesn't, just doesn't lead you to think of a repeatable, ongoing execution for the individual. And believer, it was that kind of once and for all death that the old you, from the slab of sinful solidarity with the rest of the human race that, that went through, at conversion. It's done for you, believer. It's done. Like no man lingered on after his real crucifixion under Rome, your old self, who you were as a slave of sin and the sinful solidarity of, of the human race with Adam, so does that man not linger on and on, and you cannot go back to that man in that condition because that old self is gone was gone at, at conversion. So, verse 6, you are not, remember the continually knowing by experience part? You are not continually knowing by experience the ongoing repeated crucifixion of your old self with Christ. That's not repeatedly going on. What you are experientially knowing over and over and over is the next statement. It's the purpose that flows from your once and for all co-crucifixion with Jesus that happened at conversion. What, what is it that happened next? That's the second amazing statement. Look at verse six. In order that your body of sin might be done away with. This is what you are personally, experientially knowing repeatedly. Your body of sin is undergoing a purposeful demise. It's a purpose in order that. And it's all due to the once and for all crucifixion of your old you with Christ. Now, what does body of sin mean? It's essentially a strong way of saying sinful body. Except you have to say it with a lot of disdain. Sinful body. That's the idea. Sinful body. 
It's the body in which sin expresses itself to be exceedingly sinful. Sin is not just present in your body, but it is entrenched in your body. It is plotting its exceedingly wicked plans, and it's carrying them out in your sinful body. And that sin won't be extracted from this body entirely at this point. The purpose that your old self's once and for all death with Christ is after is that this body of sin might be done away with. That doesn't mean that the body of sin, the sinful body, gets annihilated or destroyed once and for all like your old you was destroyed once and for all. But the idea here is to make your, your sinful body progressively ineffective. Progressively make it subject to a continual demise. Now, let me give you an example. Just a few verses ahead. Look at chapter 6, verse 12. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, your death is eminent body, prone to death body, so that you obey its lusts. Now, if the idea back in verse 6 was the complete annihilation of your sinful body, how could we then be exhorted in verse 12 to not let sin reign in your prone-to-death body? Obviously, this mortal body is still subject to the influence and the forcefulness and the lording ways of sin. But it is, according to verse 6, undergoing right now a purposeful demise. Before your old self was once and for all crucified with Christ, before your conversion, your sinful, your sinful body, have to say it the right way, your sinful body was not under this purposeful demise yet. And sin, with that pre-converted sinful body, reigned freely as master over you. All your members of that body were at sin's powerful disposal. But when your old self was crucified once and for all with Christ at conversion, believer, the purposeful demise of your sinful body began. That is what you are repeatedly experientially, personally knowing to be true. That sinful body's purposeful demise, it couldn't begin until that old you that was worthy of God's wrath heap was once and for all crucified with Christ at conversion. That's the second amazing statement. Your sinful body is undergoing a purposeful demise. To what end? To what end? Were you crucified with Christ for the purposeful demise of your sinful body? It's the third amazing statement, that you would no longer be slaves to sin. Sin still has its lording ways. It still has its dominating agenda for you to consider. But we are no longer slaves to it. You see, again, the whole point here is we've changed. We've changed. We are no longer slaves to sin like we were before the old man was crucified with Christ prior to conversion. And this is actually confirmed in Romans 6, 7. Look at the next verse. For he who has died, been crucified with Christ, is freed from sin. He's no longer a slave to sin. That's the explanation for how you are no longer a slave to sin. Because the one who has died, first statement, is freed from sin's lording ways. The third statement no longer a slave to sin. Now, let's try to put these three statements all together. 
Here's the first amazing statement. A death has occurred. A death has occurred that changed our relationship to sin. Our old self was crucified once and for all with the ultimate goal that we would, third statement, no longer be slaves to sin. Romans 6, 7 confirms this. The one who has died is what? Freed from sin. These two things are inseparable. But that only covers two of the three amazing statements, the first and the last. So what then is this middle amazing statement in the, in the middle? What is it doing between our death to sin and our no longer being a slave to sin? The progressive demise of your sinful body is the purpose from your death with Christ, but it's even, it's even the proof for you that death for you has occurred. You died with Christ. It's even the proof that the death for us to experience, experientially know, has happened. It's how we experientially know I have been crucified with Christ. We can and we do personally, experientially know this bodily demise. But the second statement is also the proof that we are no longer slaves to sin. We, believer, as we personally and experientially know this sinful body's demise, we have proof that we are what? No longer slaves to sin. We are freed. So how do you experientially know that your death with Christ ultimately made you no longer a slave to sin? Well, here's your dual-directioned proof. My sinful body is undergoing a purposeful demise. This sinful body's purposeful demise is my experiential bridge of proof between my once and for all crucifixion with Christ and the fact that I'm no longer a slave to sin. This is how you experientially know both of these things. That your old self died with Christ and that you are no longer a slave to sin. And listen carefully. Right now, a new you lives out a newness of life with a sinful body that is undergoing a purposeful demise right now. Welcome to the Christian life. This is who we are. We haven't even been told what to do yet. But we got to understand who we are. So I want to ask you, is this your experience? Is this your experience? Is this what you are experiencing? Do you personally, actually, continually know this to be the case in your daily living? Do you, are you knowing your death with Christ as a result, and, and as a result that you are no longer a slave to sin? How, how are you experiencing that? Are you experiencing that? The proof of that is your sinful body is undergoing a purposeful demise and you're saying, I, I want to say yes, but what does that look like? Well, Paul doesn't at this point describe what a new life in the sinful body looks like. But we'll jump ahead just for a moment to verse 12 again. We're going to be here in a matter of months, so we'll get there soon. But verse 12, listen to this. Therefore, now does this sound like pray? Or hunter? Does this sound proactive or does it sound reactive? Does it sound eager or dreadful? Therefore, do not let sin find its way to enthronement in your prone to death body so that you obey its lusts tables have been turned. What happens in a sinful body 
Well, in that death-prone body, you are not letting sin reign such that you obey its lust. Is that your experience in your sinful body? Is that what you are personally, actually, continually knowing to be the case? It does not mean you are completely sin-free in your living, but it means you are free from sin to say no to it and to deny it a pathway to enthronement in your life. To be able to say no to its lording ways. Remember, sin, sin's not going to give you a pass now that you're a believer. Sin will look for every way to dominate you. And believer, you know this to be the case, don't you? You get fooled, you get deceived into a sin and find out next thing that you are owned by it. It can feel that way. But it means you are free from sin to say no to it and let it not have its lording ways over you anymore. Are you experiencing any of this? Or does sin just seem to have its way with you? Broad scale. And let's back up again, bigger picture in verses five to seven. And that knowing experientially that you died with Christ and are thus no longer a slave to sin, that flows out of your complete union with Christ, crucified and raised from the dead. And you can be confident and assured this effective union was complete. It wasn't half achieved for you. And that is grace's fight against sin in you, believer, that you would not be doubtful, but instead be assured that what your full and complete union with Christ achieved. But did you notice in verses five to seven, he didn't mention much about his resurrection and the implications of that? It's because that's coming in verses eight to 10 next week, Lord willing. So I'm going to go back to the question at the beginning. How would you describe yourself in your sanctification process, believer? Confident? Not arrogant, not cocky, confident. Or doubtful? Are you proactive in your sanctification? Or lately do you feel like you've just been reactive, just in a corner with your hands up, and you're just getting clobbered? wondering how much longer can you take this? Do you find yourself in your sanctification process hopeful, hopeful, or fearful? Are you eager to fight? Do you wake up thinking, I've got to get after it today. I'm going to. I can. Or do you wake up dreading another fight, another battle? What difference does Romans 6 make? It makes all of the difference. It makes all of the difference in you. Entrust yourself. Entrust yourself to this God of grace. Entrust yourself to what he says about you, that it is true. Cast everything you know of yourself on everything you understand so far about what is said about grace and what is achieved for you. Entrust yourself to it. The tables have been turned. It's not heaven. They haven't been turned that far. But the tables have been turned. You are not what you were. And you're not yet what you will be. But you are what you are, and you should be certain. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, how refreshing it is to be exhorted to look away from ourselves, to not put confidence in ourselves. That's not what you're directing us to here. You're showing us how much you achieved in our lives that we might put our confidence in your achievements on our behalf.
Would you please help my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, help me to be a little bit more confident this week in this fight that you have us in. Lord, we first just thank you that your grace is not in any kind of a mutually benefiting relationship with our sin, but your grace is firmly, powerfully, decidedly against our sin. And therefore, with grace's achievements in our lives, we too can be decidedly against sin. We can be confident in that. We can be hopeful in that. We can be proactive in that. We can be eager for yet another day. Not because we trust ourselves, but because we are growing in our trust of you. And Father, I pray for anyone here this morning who just knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are still a slave to their sin. Oh God, show them your son crucified and raised from the dead, a substitute dying in their place to bear all of the penalty and the wrath of God in their place. Grant them the, the ability they never had before to trust you to run to you, to take refuge in you so that all of this can be true, so that these grace achievements can be true for them as well. We ask it in Christ's name, amen.